मंगल भगवान वीरो मंगल गौतम प्रभु ओम नमो Jai Jinendra and welcome to Mangalam. Today we have a very special episode for you. We have Professor Gary Francion speaking about the spiritual elements of Jain religion. Then we will have a beautiful bhajan by Dr. Monica Shah from Ahmedabad and then we will show you a Jain cooking, a vegan recipe for all of you to enjoy. Few weeks ago, we had introduced you to an American Jain professor, Gary Francione from Rutgers University, New Jersey. Today, we are very fortunate to have him speak to us about the Jain principles or spiritual elements of Jain religion, which he thinks that we should not lose them. He follows the Jain religion better than some of us as Jains. So please listen to him. It will definitely change your life for better. The first subject I'm going to discuss with you is the importance of maintaining a focus on the spiritual elements of Jainism. As an American Jain, as someone who was not born in India and was not born into the Jain tradition, uh, my perspective is obviously uh, uh, different. Uh, I came to Jainism because of my attraction to the, the spiritual elements of it. And as a result, those have always been foremost in my mind. I, it is always nice. I enjoy socializing with other Jains. I enjoy going to, to the temple. I enjoy being with Jains. And they are mostly uh, they are Indian Jains. Um, and I think that in many ways, the experience of Jainism is very different when you approach this uh, as someone who is Indian and born into the Jain tradition. Jainism can, in that circumstance, uh, be primarily a social and a cultural phenomenon and less of a spiritual phenomenon. And um, I think that's something to, to be concerned about in that to the extent that we see Jainism as primarily a social and cultural phenomenon, I think we lose an important element of what Jainism really is, which is a spiritual, uh, uh, it's a the Dharma of, of Ahimsa. And I think it's just very important that we focus on those spiritual elements. And you know, I, I, I also want to say as part of this that um, I've had contact with a lot of, with many young Jains, with the, the Jain youth, and I've, I've oftentimes been um, concerned that, uh, again, there is um, a tendency on the part of, of a lot of young people, particularly those born here in this country, to take their Jainism for granted or to not really take it all that seriously or not to regard it as all that important and, and to sort of let the tradition go. Uh, and, and, and to the extent that they maintain the tradition, it is primarily as a social and cultural thing. They may associate with other young people who are Jains or from Jains. Jain families, they go to Jain social events. When they're, when they're with people at various social events, those people tend to be Jains or they tend to be Indian Jains or whatever. But, but um, again, uh, many of the young people have let go of the spiritual tradition. And that strikes me as so very, very sad. And the reason why I say that is because 
Um, as I said, as an American, Jane, I came at this as from someone who was deeply interested in the spiritual principles. And the spiritual principles are marvelous. Uh, Jainism is, is um, you know, we talk about the three jewels, um, and I really think about them, uh, I, I, you know, the, the whole notion of, of right faith or right perception, right knowledge, right conduct. I, I, I see what Jainism teaches us as extremely valuable. I think of the, of the three jewels as three jewels. I think of the Jain Dharma as one of the great gifts to, 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 to the to, to the world. Um, and I see Jain Dharma as providing answers, very, very, uh, uh, in many ways, very simple answers, very simple answers to so many of the, the, the world's pressing problems. And so therefore, to let go of the, the spiritual elements of the tradition, to let go, uh, to not focus on those, it strikes me as very sad and a great shame and a great loss, not just for us as individuals and for our own journey on the path towards liberation, but for the world. Let me talk a little bit about three key principles of Jainism that I think are extremely important. Ahimsa, Aparigrehe, and Anekantavada. Um, ahimsa is the primary principle of Jainism. Jainism is the Dharma of Ahimsa. In many ways, Anikantavada and Aparigrehe are, are subsets or, or, or related principles of Ahimsa. They're different dimensions of Ahimsa. But the primary uh, uh, principle of Jainism is the principle of Ahimsa. And what does Ahimsa tell us? What, what is the, the meaning of the principle of Ahimsa? Well, there is no religion in the world, none. There is no religion in the world that has such a fully developed concept of ahimsa. There are other religious traditions that have that that that, that contain the principle of ahimsa, and there are some that have the principle of nonviolence. They don't call it ahimsa. I mean, for for example, Christianity is at least supposedly uh, 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 incorporates a very strong notion of of nonviolence, uh, and and uh, Buddhism and Hinduism uh, have the principle of ahimsa. But there is no dharma uh, in which the principle of Ahimsa plays such a crucial role as it does in Jainism. And, and, uh, and, and, and the concept is very rich in, Jain, in the Jain tradition. It is not simply a matter of not doing violence. It's, it's a matter of not speaking violence and not thinking in a violent way. What Ahimsa requires of us is really, in many ways, a transformation of who we are as individuals, and a rejection of the notion of, of, of violence in our thought, in our speech, in our conduct. Ahimsa means acting without equanimity, thinking without equanimity, speaking without equanimity, existing without equanimity. When we act without equanimity, when we do anything without equanimity, when we don't possess equanimity, we are, to some degree, engaging in ahimsa. Some forms of ahimsa are more dramatic than other forms of ahimsa. Some of my, if I do something, if I engage in violent conduct, that may be a more dramatic or a more, a more uh, 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 pointed illustration of ahimsa. But what I think, how I speak, how I react, if I don't act with equanimity, then I act with himsa. I act with violence if I don't act with equanimity. So if, if someone says something, so, says something to me and I become angry, or if I feel greed, or if my ego uh, 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 becomes involved in something, that's a form of himsa. As I say, there are different sorts. But, the, but the, 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 the notion, the principle which unites all of these notions is acting, thinking, speaking, existing without equanimity. Okay? When I have attachment, when I have aversion, I have himsa. When I'm vitraga, when I don't have attachment or aversion, I have ahimsa. So the principle of Ahimsa is a very broad principle. We shouldn't think violent thoughts about people. We shouldn't speak violently to people. We shouldn't act violently. 
But we should always also go beyond that and always try to incorporate the, 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 the principle of equanimity into every second of our lives and to always be without attachment, without aversion. Because to the extent that we aren't, we are engaging in himsa. So that's the first principle, the notion of nonviolence in thought, speech, and action, but also the state of, of being in equanimity, the, the, the state of equanimity. That's what we achieve, that's what we strive for as Jains. If we have equanimity, we can't harm other people in our thought, our speech, our action. And we can't harm ourselves. Because if we have equanimity, then we do not draw inauspicious karma to us. So we don't harm ourselves. I mean, in many ways, the principle of ahimsa tells us not only not to harm other people, it tells us not to harm ourselves. Okay? So if we, if we exist with equanimity, then we do not harm ourselves, and it's impossible to harm other people. This is an extremely important principle. If we took ahimsa seriously, there would be no war. If we took ahimsa seriously, there would be no discrimination, there would be no racism, there would be no sexism, there would be no violence to other humans, there would be no violence to animals. There would be no violence if we took that seriously. We would not have the world that we live in, which is full of violence, injustice, today, just today, over 25,000 children will starve in this world from malnutrition. That is himsa. That is something that we should all be ashamed of. That is something that should stop now. And if we took ahimsa seriously, it couldn't happen. Now, as I said before, the other two principles, anikantavare and aparigrehi, they are subsets of ahimsa. They are, they are aspects, aspects is the better word than subsets, aspects of ahimsa. Anikantavada tells us that there is a truth, there is a truth, it's not right, it's not, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the principle of Anikantavada and, and what that means. And many people think that it means that there is no truth, that the Jain the Jane doctrine, Jaina doctrine is there is no truth. That's, that's wrong. There is truth. It's just complicated. It has many sides to it. And, and so the principle of Anikantavada tells us that we should not be dogmatic. We should try that in order that, you know, none of us is, um, no, none of us is, is Kevul Gyan, at least I don't, um, and, and so we're not omniscient. And, and to the extent that we're not omniscient, we can't know what the full truth is. All we can know is we can know truth from a particular perspective or a particular angle. And as a result, we should not be dogmatic with other people. We should always listen to what they have to say. That doesn't mean that we have to agree that they are right. Because if somebody comes up to me and says, Ahimsa is wrong, violence is a good thing, that's wrong. But how many times are we in situations where we get into an argument with somebody because our perspective about a situation is one thing and their perspective is another. And, and, and oftentimes after we have the argument, we think about it and we say, you know, I now understand what that person's perspective was. And although I don't agree with it, I now see it and I understand why he or she was reacting or acting the way he or she was acting. So I think it's important, you know, again, we can do violence to other people by trying to impose our viewpoints on them, trying to impose our truth on them. We shouldn't do that. We should always avoid violence. That's not to say that there is no truth. It's just to say that truth is complex and that we are always to be open to the perspectives of others. The Jains developed the doctrine of Anikantavada largely as a result of, of trying to deal with um, when, when, when the sadhus and, 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 and religious people had, had, uh, had uh, uh, discussions and debates, um, there had to be a doctrine, there had to be some way that people could have discussions and debates without getting angry with each other. And the Jains came up with the doctrine of Anikantavada. Viewpoint, viewpoint ahimsa, that we will listen to everybody and we will try to see truth in everything. It's not to say that there is no truth, it's just to say that there's truth, that truth is complicated. The final 
element that I want to speak about as part of this, this discussion is a parigrehe. You know, we live in a materialistic world. We live in a material world and a materialistic world. And the great challenge to us spiritually is to develop our soul, our psyche, whatever you want to call it, um, which is constantly infused with material components, with karmic particles, and exists in the material universe. And we are always tempted to see ourselves as part of the material world and to, to have desires for material things. I suggest that this is the great challenge of the, of the 21st century, to reject materialism. Materialism is corrosive of our soul. Materialism can destroy us and does destroy many of us as we chase after money, as we chase, chase after cars, after homes, after clothes, after all the sorts of things that, that, that are important to us. Materialism is a very serious problem. We here in the United States are rich. We have all of this material wealth while people in the third world are starving. That's not right. There's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of, of, of incorrect, unfair, unjust distribution of resources. And we should reject that. Material things aren't important. When you're laying on your deathbed, they won't matter to you at all. And what you need to do is to see now how irrelevant they really are and how miserable chasing after them makes us. And so these, you know, in Aper Grehe is the principle of non-possession. It's the idea that if you possess, the more you possess, the more inclined you are to engage in himsa. The more inclined you are to, to, to engage, to be greedy, to be egotistical, to get angry, to want to possess, to want to protect what you own. So, Apari Grehe says, don't. That's a form of himsa. That's a form of himsa. If you want to pursue a himsa, you must not be materialistic. You must try to alienate yourself from material things. So these three doctrines, Ahimsa, Anikantavada, and Apari Grehe, they point the way. If we took those doctrines seriously, the world is still going to be full. We're all going to die no matter what. We're all going to get sick. We're all going to die. We're all going to have all sorts of problems in our lives. That is the nature of life. Okay? That's, so all those things are going to happen. But you know what? It would be a lot better. Things would be a lot better. The world would be a much better place. It would be a more peaceful place. It would be a more just place. If we took seriously the doctrines of Ahimsa, Aparigrehe, Anikantavada. We'll continue to have the problems that we have. We'll never be free of problems, but if we learn to react to those problems with equanimity, if we learn to react without violence, if we learn to act without materialism, we and the world will be a much better place. I hope you enjoyed Professor Francian's lecture. I'm sure you're going to change for a better person. We are going to take a short break and we'll be right back with A Melodious Bhajan by Dr. Monica Shah. So please don't go away. For your tax-free donations, suggestions and comments, please visit mangalamshow.com. Welcome back to Mangalam. Now we're going to present to you a beautiful melodious bhajan by Dr. Monika Shah from Ahmedabad. This bhajan is based on Rag Darbari Kannada. I'm sure you will like it and you will enjoy it.
Welcome back to Mangalam. Now it's time to have a vegan cooking. And we have Dhawal Mehta who is going to talk to Yashoda Jordan, who is going to show us some vegan recipes, how you can make it in Azif. Please enjoy. Welcome to Vegan Jane Cooking. I'm your host, Dhawal Mehta, and joining us in the studio kitchen today is Yashoda Jordan. Hi, Yashoda, welcome Hi. to the show. Um, so you're going to be making soy blue cheese sticks. Um, so what do we need to get started? Well, first of all, you go to, the, uh, to any uh, supermarket freezer and you get this puff pastry sheet, which ha has two sheets. So let the one sheet um, defrost a bit, put a little bit of flour on the surface and also flour on your rolling pin. And just do it a little bit, not too much thin it out. Then the uh, soy blue cheese, this is only available online at this moment. It is made by She's Cheese, the guys in, in, in Scotland. And you just put a little bit over here because it's uh, so pungent. The other way to do also is with the soy parmesan, which is also very good. But this is just nice and mild and very flavorful. So then we carefully roll over. Go over with your rolling pin and make sure the edges are tight. Like this. And then just cut out, let's say in quarter inch th uh, wide. And then you put it on baking paper or in silk pad if you have one and put it in a preheated oven and turn it down to 350 degrees and make sure you don't overcook it or, or burn it because it, it takes only a couple of minutes, five, eight minutes to ha see them rise. Anyway, this is how it looks like when it comes out. And this is what the finished product looks like. Okay, taste it. Easy to make. Go ahead. I can have some? Yeah, yeah. Okay, these are soy blue cheese sticks. Mmm, it's excellent. And here's how you can make them. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Mangalam. We will meet you again next time. In a week's time, we would like to know your views about our show. So please write to us at mangalamshow at gmail.com. Please also visit our website at www.mangalamshow.com. Until next time, Jai Jirendra.